I offer a drone. Good luck. Good luck. And the game is starting. We have Orca Chess playing with the white pieces, opening with e4. And uh, Chessborn is playing with the black pieces, and she plays the French defense. We know that uh, Orca Chess is an experienced and strong chess player who won tournaments both in Germany and French. And he plays in the styles of an uh, Orca. Uh, Dance for also the, uh, the name Orca Chess. He beats his opponents with direct and sharp attacking chess. And in uh, one Simo exhibition against former world champion Fishy Anand, he managed to score a draw. So definitely a strong player to, uh, to look out for. And with black, we have a top woman chess player from the Ukraine. In her youth, she became a bronze champion under the age of 12 and 18 um, in the Ukraine championships. He is a also an attacking player, ready for sharp and open positions. And uh, the name Chessborn is derived from the Game of Thrones character Daenerys Stormborn. And uh, we all know how it ended with her. So hopefully this game will, uh, will go differently for her and uh, we'll see a very sharp, interesting fight. So um, as I said, the French defense was placed. The game itself though didn't go into the main lines, but we'd rather see a quieter approach from Orca Chess deciding to just develop his pieces and throwing in these cheeky bishop moves after which Black has to um, decide and she, yeah, Angelica decides to push her pawn up and one of the golden rules is to never play f6 but uh, she decides to do it in any case and let's see how um, Orca Chess tries to exploit this throughout the game Right now Black is thinking um, of how to develop the minor pieces here. Because uh, eventually you do need to get all your pieces out in order to uh, get the game going. And it's not so easy for her to decide where to put, for example, this bishop from f8. Because uh, after the f6 move, the bishop will be blocked on the long diagonal. Oh, thing was swept away. <laughs> it's allowed, of course. Um, hopefully it doesn't take away the concentration um, from Angelica, aka Chessborn, who seems to be out of book here and has uh, on her own. There are different moves she can play, let's see what she decides. Going for, she is going for the bishop g7. Rapidly followed by bishop g2. Both players have financetoed their bishops, which means that they move the pawn on the king side and then slide your bishop in onto the place where the pawn was. To, uh, to have a big scope on these long diagonals. But currently both of these diagonals are blocked by their own pawns. So we'll, in the future we'll likely see these pawns trying to get traded or pushed forwards to open up the positions. Uh, getting into a positions that uh, both players seem to like, open and sharp games. 
First, develop the knight. Very logical and good move. Knight to e7, getting ready to castle short. Which is something that white can do here as well. Or maybe they can bring in their last knight into the game. Both of which seem to be logical moves. Let's see what is decided. Of course, there's other decent moves as well, which Orca Chess could uh, think about. Uh, one thing to probably take note of is that Chessborn is very fast with her pawn in front of her queen. When she pushes this pawn, puts the pawn in the center, and she can even push it even further, attacking that bishop on e3. Orca Chess not afraid for this, he just castles short. <laughs> we see a little stare down. Maybe there's something Angelica, aka Chessborn, uh, sees he can exploit right now. Um, if there is something, I'd be surprised. But she is thinking about certain moves. But uh, castling in chess is uh, pretty much mandatory uh, in a lot of games. He opts for b6, making space for the other bishop to slide into the probable b7 square, where it can counter um, Orca Chess's bishop from g2. And that is also her last minor piece that is to be developed. Bishop pawn to b6 gets ready to, uh, to finish development, basically. Right now, white's to move. I would assume you bring in your knight from b1, maybe d2 or c3, just to get all your pieces into the game. Another move maybe could be to strike in the center right now with pawn push d4. Let's see what Orca Chess is deciding upon. D4 is a committal move. When you move your pawns, they can't go backwards. So whenever you decide to move a pawn, you have to be sure that it's not a bad move. And I think... That's what Orca Chess is uh, deciding upon now. All right, so he, he, he puts the king forward, queen to d2. Very often you see this setup with the bishop in front of the queen. And then sometimes you want to trade this dark squared bishop. So you play bishop all the way to h6. In the current position, I am not completely convinced that is necessarily a good plan, but queen to d2 on its own is a okay move. It will connect the rooks later on, gets your queen off the back rank, and um, it's a sort of developing move, so uh, nothing too special happening just yet. And uh, Angelica will castle short which seems like the correct move. And there's the typical bishop h6, creating these bishops, which could result in a weak king for black, because that bishop on g7 tends to be a very important defender uh, of the enemy, of, of their own king. But without these bishops, white could maybe go for some attack, which is exactly what Orca Chess is looking for in these type of games, going for sharp and tactical chess. There's no reason for a uh, chessborn to trade here. You can just exactly finish the development of the last bishop, putting it on a very good and active square, b7. See a fast trade by Orca Chess, which is recaptured, of course, with the king. And now, I think the pawn on f6 is not so much of an issue anymore. I find it hard to see how white can exploit any weaknesses. Um, which, actually, I don't really think there are. So it seems that black uh, has solved most problems out of the opening. And after uh, the pawn push d5, black should be able to be just fine. But white is first. White strikes in the center before black can with the d5 pawn break. Which is, uh, yeah. Now the position gets tense. There is tension in the center. Pawns can be traded, which opens up files for both the king and rooks, and possibly the bishop later on. So this is a, a decision you have to uh, think through. Which is why I would expect 
both players to have a good thing here. Urca just plays on his um, on his intuitive, assuming that d4 is the correct plan. And uh, Chessboard needs to now be careful that she doesn't get attacked by opening up the position too soon. The one thing that speaks in favor of the black position is that all the minor pieces, so both the knights and the bishop, have left their original square and are developed. And if you compare that to the position from white, the knight on b1 has yet to enter the game. So generally speaking, a pawn break like d5, which is played, you want to do this as soon as you finish development. But it seems that Orca Chess did not yet do that, but he did strike in the center, and we see a capture on d4, with a recapture of the knight, of course, to regain the pawn. And now there's two knights that are currently uh, having some tensions there. Maybe black decides to trade, because then the queen comes into the center of the game. Which could mean that it will be under attack. But that's not a necessary move, though. more principled move would be for black to put the rook on the semi-open file. So that would mean rook from a8 to c8. Because of that file just open up. And that's exactly what uh, she does. You can see that uh, she is well trained in the classical themes of chess. That she will develop all her pieces. She will put rooks on the open files. And uh, yeah, she hasn't done anything amazingly spectacular. But she has gotten a good position with black. And now we see Orkaches finally developing his last knight from b1 towards the center on c3. And now we reach uh, the middle game. The opening is over and uh, the real struggle will start here. And a very interesting position. Because it's a bit hard to see what black wants to do here. As far as a plan or coming up with ideas to get something going. And I feel like with the queen on d2, bearing down this open d file, there is a backwards pawn from black on d7, which could be attacked um, with another rook behind it. So Chessborn is aware of this, of course, and needs to find the correct way to go forward, which, which is pretty difficult to, uh, to find, I think. Let's see what she can come up with in this... Uh, Start of the middle game, and the real struggle of this game as well. He decides to trade the knights. <laughs> Which uh, looks to be like a surprising move by uh, Orca Chess. There's no choice for him but to simply recapture this knight. And now that leaves the queen all the way in the center. Which uh, is likely to going to get attacked with the other knight that's now currently on e7. Because a queen in the center is also dangerous if you let it linger there for too long. Let's see what Esborn comes up with. She strikes in the center herself. Like a true experienced strong chess player. He goes for the center. I like this move a lot. Pawn to d5. Creating a lot of tension. And uh, yeah, the ball is definitely in uh, Orca's chess's court now of how to respond. Because, uh, this is a great move by, uh, by Black. I really like this move. The weak pawn that we talked about earlier on d7 is now gone. Uh, she puts the pawn in the center, challenging the white center. And uh, yeah, getting ready to open up the position. Hopefully in her favor, but at least her pieces, her bishop and the knight, will start to um, come out and create threats against white. So great play. And I think we'll see for the first time that uh, Orca Chess has to really think here of what to do. Because right now I think there is a threat perhaps of taking the pawn, leaving the queen vulnerable in the center. And allowing the enemy rooks to just utilize these open files. But very quickly it's decided that she should just take the pawn. And there's uh, four different ways uh, black can recapture. Taking with the queen the pawn is not so good. And very quickly it's decided that it's the knight. 
which makes sense because the knight was the most backwards piece, which now jumps into the center and leaps in to regain the pawn and uh, yeah, nicely outpost itself on d5. <clears throat> There might be some tactics though, because the knight, the black knight in the center of the board, if that one moves, the bishops are opened up against each other. And it could mean that the black bishop all the way on b7 can be taken with the white bishop on g2 in front of the king. So let's see how white going to respond here. Could put a rook on a D or E1 square, nice and open files where rooks belong. Then you need to be worried about a lot of different tactical sharp ideas that could arise out of this tension with these bishops both eyeing down each other on this long diagonal. And it seems that Orkachez is not really sure. Maybe he doesn't like the position anymore or maybe he just doesn't know what to do. Uh, wobbling a bit on his chair, he's, he's contemplating the moves. Um, I expect uh, Orkachev to just take the knight off in the center of the board because a knight in the center is such a strong piece. It can't just let uh, it sit there for too long or there might be coming threats that are just too much to handle. And that's exactly what's happening. The uh, knight's trade is just upon us. And now Chessborn needs to decide how to retake this knight. Very quickly she decides to take with that bishop, which is a good decision because taking back with the pawn, it means that you are looking down onto your own pawn, which is not that good for a bishop. The bishop likes its open diagonals. Um, but we could see a, a, a more of a trade down along this d5 square with white taking this bishop off the board as well. And then we'll have a very interesting endgame uh, arising, but that is not yet upon us. But let's see how Orkaches responds. He does in fact take this bishop, and uh, the middle game very quickly uh, disappeared. <laughs> and we're going to uh, going to an endgame with only heavy pieces on the board. And Chessborn is uh, offering a queen trade on top of that as well, which um, I think is going to be accepted because otherwise the queen is too good in the center. So we see a lot, a lot of trades. And all that is left now are the rooks. And this is an interesting position because black has a, what is so-called an isolated pawn. This was just touched by uh, Orkaches. It means that it's a pawn without any pawns on the sides. And technically this is considered a weak pawn. The upside for black here is that both the rooks can utilize these open files. And especially the e-file is probably a file that is worth fighting for. And also the king from uh, Angelica is already a little bit closer to the center. So when you reach an endgame, kings becomes uh, actually an attacking piece, a useful piece. Since there's no longer the mating attack, the king can actually aid into helping out in this endgame. And we'll see how uh, Chessborn responds here, coming up with ideas of how to uh, create something in this, I would say equal endgame, but there's definitely a lot of chances for both sides to uh, play for a win. <laughs> she looked at the clock briefly. There is plenty of time for her to come up with uh, some amazing idea. And uh, it seems that she is really thinking through her options here. Move like pawn to f5 is an idea, making sure that the king has quick access towards the center. Or the principled uh, move would be the rook from f8 to e8, because the rook belongs on the open file. Wow, what a move. <laughs> In fact, she does neither, and she just six sacrifices a pawn, which... Um, Seems like a very weird move, but there is a very clear idea behind it. The pawn is gone and grabbed, but in return, the rook enters on the second rank. That is amazing. Just giving away a pawn for activity of the rook. I like this a lot. Because now the enemy, the black rook, is entered on c2. And there is a lot of pressure this rook is going to uh, exert onto these pawns. And this will be uh, tough to defend. 
that is a passive move. Simply studying the rook one step to the side to just defend. And now I would expect the other rook to start entering. Maybe rook e8 or rook d8. He goes for rook e8, intending to get both her rooks on the second rank, which uh, could spell disaster upon white's position. And the extra pawn in the center of the board is a little bit meaningless. All right, so to stop the rook from entering, Orca Chess offers a rook trade, which could also cost him a pawn. So the, active the activity of the rook or the pawn is already going to be returned, that Angelica will win back one pawn if she so desires. And honestly, I think she will, because her rook will just stay very good and it's really all black. And in fact, she goes for the trade, and she's now going to not even take the pawn. She centralizes her king. This is amazing chess. She doesn't care about material. She wants activity in the end game. And I think that's super important. Because material can always be grabbed later. But when you activate all your pieces, you can create threats. And this is exactly what we see here. The king stops the enemy rook from penetrating on the e file. So there will be no rook e6 or e7 the king will control all these squares. What a fine, fine, fine move. Really impressive the, how she handles this endgame. And it would be even uh, nicer if she can manage to actually win. Because a lot of rook endgames tend to remain within the drawing range. Um, even though it looks like black has a lot of activity here. And maybe can, uh, yeah, can actually win this. It will be interesting to see what happens. We see uh, Orca just thinking here of like, what can I do to create some counterplay? Where can my pieces go to start attacking stuff? Preferably pawns, because that's uh, all that's left. Maybe we see a rook going up and then sliding to the edge of the board where it can start attacking pawns. Because the king is kind of cut off. The, the white king cannot really go up the board because of how good this rook is positions, unless you use your own pawns as a guard. So you go up with your king and then you can slide to f3 later on. But this will mean you will be losing these pawns on the queen side, which are currently attacked. Very, very tough decision and extremely skillfully played by black, if I can say. Because this is a truly showcase of how you can handle the endgame. And it seems that Orca Chess is really struggling here. Like, what can he do to avoid getting crushed in this endgame? Doesn't seem so easy. Maybe you can slide the rook behind this pawn here in the center and then run it forward. He decides differently and he puts the rook on e3, trying to activate this rook using this third rank. But I would expect... Uh, chessborn to just grab this pawn on b2 finally but uh, as before she doesn't really care too much about pawns if she's not completely activated but it seems that right now all her pieces are in the right squares maybe it's time to start grabbing pawns and indeed she will finally regain the pawn that she sacrificed a lot of moves ago now she has a very nice position White has two sort of isolated pawns, one on a2 that is already attacked, and then the pawn in the center that actually can become strong, but it can also become a liability because it can be attacked by the enemy king. For now, Orkaches needs to deal with this pawn on a2 that is hanging. So either he moves it up the board or he protects it with the rook. That's his choice. And he slides the rook in front of the pawn, protecting it and creating a counter threat onto the pawn on, from black on a7 which cannot be allowed to be captured so therefore it is pushed up the board and we finally also see that the white king orca chess is going to aid to helping um, push the pawns here in the center king centralizes to e6 and white does the same but black is one step ahead and can, if she wants to, they put her king in front of this pass pawn, which is in fact what's happening here. 
That pawn is firmly stopped, but it's also defended by the king now on e3. So black has control here, but in order to win this, she needs a bit more. She needs to create more threats and more problems for white. Goes even further into the enemy territory with her king to c4. That's a brave move because it stops the pawn uh, protecting like the it's it moves away from in front of the pawn so it could also mean that this pawn here in the center of the board can become something um, that white can counter with i think that's just a pawn push on the king side pushing the pawns up the board getting them a little bit closer to promoting but it seems that white is lacking any good plans and ideas. And uh, if you t count the pawns here on the left side of the board, black has two pawns there and there's only one defender pawn. I would assume that the idea for black here is to push these pawns up the board and create a passed pawn. But white also has a passed pawn on d4 and the rook steps behind the passed pawn and now this d pawn becomes the counter counter threat. This d-pawn will go very, very fast. Angelica needs to make sure that she doesn't allow this pawn there in the middle of the board to start running up and create a lot of problems for her. She calculates, she grabs, she moves the rook back. She's just in time to stopping this pawn. But it will mean that her rook is very passive, but the pawn is stopped and now she has two pass pawns on the left side of the board that can also start to run. very tense the pawn gets pushed even further and the rook drops back just in time to stop it from promoting now the enemy the white king centralizes itself seems like a good move white needs to counter with this pawn here in the center otherwise the black pawns on the left side of the board the queen side just start marching and in fact they already start marching and both players are also Kind of getting low on time. Two minutes left for Orca Chess. Uh, sorry, two minutes left for Chessborn and three minutes for Orca Chess, who now moves his king even further up the board to d5. Angelica pushes her pawn all the way to a3. And now this is going to be very tense. Who will be first with the promoting of the pawn? I mean, Black has an extra pawn, so that will be in their favor. But the white pawn on d6 is supported by both the rook and the king. So that was also a very dangerous counter threat that white has here. And while the time is ticking down to the last two minutes for Orca Chess, it's, it's, it's going to be very tense who, who wins this. It's basically a pawn race at this point. Very, very hard to calculate because it all will come down often just to one, one move. Will be this one step first. Okay, the pawn is pushed all the way to the 7th rank, one square away from promoting. Now the, so the black rook has to move. She's deciding where to go, but she doesn't have much time. There's only 1 minute 30 left, and that's all she has. There's no increment. The rook, instead of stopping the pawn, completely goes to the left, supporting this pawn on a3. The black pawn that's also close to promoting, while still guarding this d8 square, where the white pawn is about to promote. King goes to the left, attacks the pawn, and yeah, the pawn is, seems to... Uh, this is a, a, a close call here, because white is about to promote, but so is black. And the time is still ticking down. We see the pawn push all the way to a2 from black. White rook drops back to defend. I'm not sure if that was the best move, but it seems it's, it's very hard to play this position. And the last minute is, is currently in. He's below one minute, and Orca Chess has still got one minute 30 left. Time will be a real factor here, and it's going to be big, big time trouble. Let's see who handles it the best. So they can both promote. They both have one pawn at the verge of promoting. But the problem is that the rook will just take if either of the pawn promotes. The white king now targets the, the black rook in the corner, and the rook has to move. The rook has to move, and she has to do it fast. 45 seconds left. He's reaching for it, swings the rook over to the other side of the board, where it could not be touched by the king for quite a while. This is so tense. Who will be uh, 
coming out of this skirmish with the Bonds, both so far down the board, the, the best? Orkacic is really thinking here. He steps his king closer to the pawn, helping it to promote. Angelica does the same, and both pawns are about to promote here. But 38 seconds left against 51. This will be a like a blitzing out. This will go so fast. Both like white promotes. The rook is sacrificed to stop the promoting of the pawn. And black still has this pawn all the way on a2. But at the moment, white is up a full rook. But it seems that the enemy rook or the white rook has to give itself up for this pawn there all the way at the edge of the board on a2. It cannot be allowed to promote. So some checks and the black king goes up. And now the left, the extra pawn that Angelica has on b5, on this b5, can be used as shelter. Oof, little trick there to stop the promoting of the pawn with this rook, threatening a check from behind. She uses the other pawn to push. She Okay, this is going to go so fast. 30 seconds against 16. Only 16 seconds left. The rook drops all the way back, stopping the promoting of the pawn. Queens trades. Pawn grabs 12 seconds against 24. And it seems that black is going to get another queen. Now up a full queen, so a technically one position. But with the time running this low, oh my god, there's only a couple seconds left for both players. Will she be able to win? He just throws in checks. Five seconds left for Orca Chess. He doesn't know where to put his king. He's going. He's trying. Three seconds. It seems that he's going to get flagged here. And also, she now stops the pawn from promoting. And time has run out. And on top of that... Exactly. And this is how it ends. Good game. <laughs> Crazy. It's a very, very, uh, very interesting endgame. I, th I thought um, the free pawn is, is is making it. It's very dangerous. But then yes. you have the two connected passers here mm -hmm. on the other wing, and somehow uh, maybe I should go king to c7 first to mm -hmm. spare a temp. Or maybe tempo. you should always attack my pawn on b5. If you attack my pawn somehow, then uh, I cannot go forward with my king. To B3, B2, and to promote. You think it's better to wait and attack this? And if you go through, then I can just take. And yes, you take and this and then, and then, then this? Okay. Probably. But I think earlier, when I played Rook C2, maybe instead of Rook B1, you could play B3. And uh, I don't know, then at the end, you could lose uh, only one pawn on A2. And. Uh, yeah, but um, mm, yeah, after my rook was active, I was thinking about this d4 move. I didn't know if it was the right right way to play there, but my weak, my pawn was weak, and if I try to go on the e file, then you can simply attack it and somehow win. It's, so I decided it's isolated. I think in attacking fashion. It is. Um, it's a good good sacrifice to activate your rooks. I thought, okay, I can maybe I can play against the isolated pawn. Have yeah, bits, maybe um, you should have played something. Maybe you should have played rook d1 and tried to to keep the pressure a bit more. Yeah. I think your d5 move was very good. Um, yeah, very good transition to the end game. I thought as a positionally white is very very good as a very solid, very safe. Yes. King is not so good structure, but after d5. I haven't yes. seen what, what an alternative. Alternative uh, one I've seen is um, e5. It's interesting, but then yes. your knight gets uh, gets squares on f5 or c6, and I think the white it's should unclear. take on d5 because otherwise, yeah, e5 uh, d4 can be played. Yeah. yeah, so you should take and probably yeah just trade everything. Yes, and go to the end game. I don't. Maybe there was other option, but yeah, I didn't see. So it's, uh, it was it was it was okay, okay not necessarily for you to maybe rook rook e three was the last move which I didn't like maybe from you maybe instead of rook e three rook d one and try to go for a pawn if you but you can blockade your, if you king the pawn and then how yeah. can I make progress I thought it's, yeah I thought if you get in front of the pawn it's it's difficult to promote and the pawn is getting weak. In the end game. Or maybe yeah. go back, protect b2, and then if I go rook d2, take your d4 pawn, 
then you could maybe play rook c1 threatening with rook to common seventh string to check and get the pawn and maybe your rook is and active then I, enough to yes okay. and then i have to go back to d7 to protect the seventh string and then maybe you're a little bit more active because my rook is kind of uh, passive it should, uh, should protect the seventh string and yeah you can go uh, <laughs> with your king to the center maybe maybe, maybe. that could be an uh, Maybe that's improvement, and um, <laughs> but anyway, it was a very very sharp endgame, and yeah, <laughs> not not so much time left in yes. the end. Congratulations! <laughs> Thank you.